Let's bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege. It's always a privilege just to be able to even have your word, to have our own Bibles, and to gather together like this in unity of the faith. We just thank you so much for not leaving us in the dark, both literally and figuratively. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your kindness, and your faithfulness, all motivated by your love. Father, we ask that you bless those in our congregation that couldn't be here this evening, especially that you bless them in their spirits and let them know we're with them in spirit as well. And Father, most of all, we are eternally grateful that you sent your precious Son down to the earth for us to take human form, to become a perfect sacrifice and a substitute for us on the cross. Father, we ask that you bless this time right now. Help us concentrate on your word. Help us forget about the details of life, but just be in the moment right now with you, your word, and your spirit. It's in Christ's precious name we pray, and by the power of your spirit we pray. Amen. Okay. So the book of Hebrews, part 18, we march on in this wonderful series. On Sunday, we had a priceless message that came from our last two blogs. In fact, I think almost three quarters of the lesson on Sunday might have been a spinoff from the latest blogs. And it was, it was super. I loved it. Uh, if you didn't listen to Sunday's message or if you have an inkling that you didn't get it all on Sunday, Listen to the Spirit and listen to it again, because it, it was it was one of those ones that you need to um, keep, you know, uh, almost like keep record of, to go back and listen to and share it with those that it might also be helpful to. Uh, very good on perspective. So, that being said, on the board, our two most recent blogs were what is biblical discipline and we're supposed to stick together. And not only do they amplify what we've been learning from the pulpit, but they certainly apply to the audience of Hebrews that were going under some very serious, real attacks. So the question came up on Sunday, did the Spirit try to get them out of the suffering or express pity towards them, or did the Spirit encourage them within the suffering? To rise above it all even. And I think the answer is pretty obvious, especially when you remember the first four verses of the book of Hebrews, the prologue, about the majesty of Jesus Christ. Anytime we remember the majesty of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, even though he was innocent, we can go through anything and we can overlook or overcome anything. We can rise above it all, whatever it is that God asks us to go through. So God ordains suffering in our lives at the right times to sanctify us and to bring himself glory in the end. And even though we might not understand it right now as we're going through it, when we see him face to face, we will see clearly, completely clearly, and be thankful he allowed certain things in our lives to get us from point A to point B. Uh, Pastor and I were talking last week, I think it was, and we we're talking about basically not knowing the details and struggling while you're going through something. But years later, you know, when you look back on it and you see the fruit and you see how it changed you and you're actually thankful, you know, looking back on it, that you went through that thing. And that's just a glimpse of what we're going to see when we get to heaven, what we're going to understand when we get to heaven about what God allowed us to go through. Maybe even to carry us to the day of our salvation, by the way. Don't underestimate that. So God has infinite wisdom, and we must trust that he allows certain things in our lives for our ultimate good. Romans 8, 28. 
how and why would we ever challenge someone that has infinite wisdom? Is there anything more foolish than that, right? Someone has, who has truly all the facts. So on the board, uh, this came out on Sunday regarding suffering and sanctification. Anytime God sanctifies one of his children, he is glorified, regardless of how he accomplishes it. And pastor pleaded with us on Sunday to please remember this point on the board. It doesn't matter. In the end, it doesn't matter. To us right now, it matters, right? Especially when we're in pain. But in the end, it does not matter how he chooses to sanctify us. It's the uh, finished product. And it's the peaceful fruit of righteousness in the end, at the end of discipline, right? Hebrews 12, it's all going to be worth it because you're going to look, look, look back and be very pleased and that you brought glory to God with your life. So Pastor also strongly encouraged us to throw out our fleshly ideas, 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 it's like I'm from Providence, our fleshly ideas about fair or undeserved suffering. And maybe some of the things we've learned in the past, some old doctrines, might need to be thrown out or put aside. Because as we've been learning, <laughs> this is all about God. It's not about us. You know, we come to Christianity wanting it to be about us and improving our lives, right? Having our pain taken away, etc. But God is not here to please us. We've been created by Him to please him. That's the truth of the matter. And that's how it ought to be because he's the creator. We're just created beings that he created for a purpose, a wonderful purpose. But we wouldn't even be alive if it weren't for him creating us. So how can it not be about him? How can it not be about giving thanks to the one who created us? So turn again in your Bibles to Romans 9, 14. Romans 9, 14. What a wonderful chapter this is. Talk about, you know, getting your head straight. This will do it for you. Because we have our skewed human perspectives. Romans 9, 14. What then shall we say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. It depends on God who has mercy. Again, the point on the board, suffering and sanctification. Anytime God sanctifies one of his children, he is glorified, regardless of how he accomplishes it. So again, look at verse 14, Romans 9. Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Some translations say, may it never be. On Sunday, we were encouraged to stop trying to rationalize God with our human minds. God is not bound by our thoughts on what is fair. He's the one with infinite wisdom, remember. Who the heck are we to even think we can question God? It shows you how arrogant we are and how patient God is. But as the Spirit brought up on Sunday, we can't even manage our own finances well. We can't even have peace-filled relationships with other people. And we're going to tell God how to run the universe. amazing. I always keep thinking, and this is coming up later in the lesson, I always keep thinking of, you know, a parent-child relationship and the difference between the wisdom of an adult parent and a, a young child, right? It's really huge, but not even close to as huge as it is with God and us morons. So the fact is that God is God, and we have to remember that. That means he's the supreme controller of the universe. Forget all the fake superheroes 
that Hollywood is trying to get you to fantasize about, such as what? Masters of the universe? Why do you think they're positioned that way? And maybe not for you as a believer, you can just see it as what it is. How many unbelievers don't see it as it is? How many unbelievers start to hope that maybe, just maybe, there's some supernatural human to hope in and look to? Some savior, in other words, without looking to God. So maybe these harmless cartoons are designed to distract souls from God Almighty, the true creator. And maybe they're imposters to your soul. Just something to think about. But on the board, God is God. God and God alone is the supreme controller of the universe. And he can and will do or allow whatever he sees fit. Often for reasons we just don't know about and can't understand. Yet. One day we will. We can uh, support this point on the board from Romans 9, but also 1 Corinthians 13, 12. So hold your place where you are in Romans and go to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. God is the supreme controller of the universe. He can do whatever he wants, whatever he sees fit in his perfect wisdom. And we're not going to know the reasons on a lot of things till we get to heaven. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Can you imagine? how much clearly, how much more clearly we're going to see, perfectly even. Can a five-year-old understand or even be told certain truths about life? Never mind grasp them. You wouldn't dare tell a five-year-old about certain things about the realities of life. A wise parent bites their tongue and simply asks the young child to trust them, to trust their love for them, even when they don't understand. They might even be in pain. But you have to say, you're going to have to trust me on this one. I can't tell you right now. And it's the exact same way with God. On Sunday, we were asked some painful questions, however, on why God allows certain things, some really serious situations of suffering in this life and even hell in eternity. Why does he allow hell if he knows people are going to end up there? Why does he create people at all? if he knows they're going to end up there. As usual, we find the answers when we keep on reading our Bibles, so let's go back to Romans 9.17. In humility, Romans 9.17, For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Remember, we've all sinned against the Holy One of the universe, and we rightly deserve hell by his perfect standards. So the fact that he gives mercy to anybody is amazing. Amazing grace. You will say to me then in verse 19, Why have you made me like this? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I I jumped ahead. Sorry about that. Go to verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Of course he does. On the board. Can you possibly imagine this piece of pottery talking back to the person who owns those hands? There would be nothing more foolish. The problem is, we think we're more than a lump of clay. 
What does the Bible say? In Genesis, the first three chapters, right? Is it chapter two or three? We come from the dust of the ground. Add a little bit of water and voila, you have clay. That's what we are. And he graciously gave us a soul within these bodies. But that's what we are. And we have the audacity to talk back to God. Look at Romans 9.22 again. Romans 9.22. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. In other words, without the darkness, there's no appreciation of light. Think about it that way. In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So here was pastor's uh, emotional message, if you will, on Sunday for the rest of Christianity on the board. Stop trying to rationalize God with your human mind. God is in no way bound to your definition of fair. God does whatever he wills, whenever he wills, however he wills, with whomever he wills, and that's the end of it, period. He is sovereign the supreme controller of the universe. You know, it's so funny, I, I think about this sometimes, how unbelievers, they um, want to resist God or accepting God or they want to talk back and yell at God even, right? Why this then? Why that then? And they forget that if God really does exist, he's not only, he's not the universe like some people say. Some people think the universe is God, so to speak. God is beyond the universe. God is the one that created everything you see in the sky. So you might want to just pause before you talk back the way that you have an attitude towards him. If he's that powerful, in other words, you know, <laughs> not too smart. So at the very least, be humble enough to sincerely ask God why, or ask God to open your eyes. And as Pastor shared on Sunday, if it's not for us to understand, then it's certainly not for us to question. If you can't understand it, then you don't have the right to question it. You're not, you're, you're not in the know. It's above your pay grade. So God does, however, give us little glimpses of his grace and his divine plan, his reasons. Turn again to Romans 11.32. Romans 11.32. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So this is a glimpse into the wisdom of God's plan. Again, Romans 11.32, God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. On the board, this word consigned, we saw on Sunday from Sucleo, it means to enclose shut in, make subject to. Strong says it means to shut up on all sides, shut up completely, so to deliver one up to the power of a person or thing that he is completely shut in, as it were, without means of escape. You can picture a prison that is unescapable, has no ways out. God has shut us in, all of us in, for a reason. On the board, look at these other translations again. Romans 11.32 in the Amplified. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all, Jew and Gentile alike. And on the board, Young's literal translation, for God did shut up together the whole to unbelief, that to the whole he might do kindness. What else do you see in the last half of this verse? 
either the translation in your Bible or the translation on the board. Hopefully you notice the word may or might, that he may or might show kindness or mercy. And that points to the sovereignty of God. It's his prerogative to give mercy. We've had blogs on that, right? It's his prerogative. Mercy is no longer mercy if you try to force it. Mercy is freely given out of kindness, pure kindness. <clears throat> so, again, it's God's prerogative. He's the potter over the clay. He's the creator over the created. And motivated by his great love, he's chosen to show some mercy, some people mercy, who rightly deserve help. So it's all about his mercy. His sovereign mercy decided to do something for those of us that were condemned. We also have to remember our starting point, and that's what we often forget. That's man's biggest, that might be man's biggest problem, is um, the arrogance of being unaware that we're all sons of disobedience, that we're all guilty as sin before God. That's the biggest problem, that void, the unwillingness to admit that we're disobedient, that we're sinful, a la Ephesians 2. So this is what the Bible gives us on the sovereign grace of God. It's not like we started out as good people, as the world will often say. So don't be deceived. We started out under judgment, in sin. So anything that God does that is good toward us is undeserved. Kindness, by His sovereign grace alone. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.14. If you want to hold your place, that's fine, but 2 Corinthians 5.14. <clears throat> Here's a view into God's sovereign grace, how he acted on our, our behalf out of his loving kindness. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. What does it say again in verse 18? All this is from God. Do you understand that he didn't have to do any of this? Who's the one that stepped out of his comfort zone and acted in goodness on our behalf? It wasn't us. We were his enemies in Romans 5. Since you're in 2 Corinthians, go to 2 Corinthians 8-9. 2 Corinthians 8-9. All this is from God, from his sovereign grace. He could have easily turned his back on the guilty. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich in heaven, for example, yet for your sake he became poor, 
He entered into the flesh on this crummy, crazy planet so that you, by his poverty, might become rich, might have eternal life. It's amazing. Not only did God not turn his back on us, but he did something outrageous and horrible to come save us. And what do we do? We get arrogant and say, well, I want to know why. I want an exact answer why this is happening or this is allowed, etc. But we must credit God alone for his sovereign grace that even thought about us at all. Why did God choose this exact way to save us? We have no idea, really. Only God really knows. But we are called to be okay with that by faith. We bring glory to God by faith. Hebrews 11, which I'm sure we'll get to in some detail at some point in this series. By faith, we bring glory to God. Listen, I tell people this all the time. Um, unbelievers or new believers, the angels are baffled when we follow God through hard times because we don't see him. Angels see God, right? They've seen God. They see God. They have access to heaven. When we follow God in unfair circumstances, in our own terms, they're baffled. They have no idea how we do it. What, what just happened? You just brought glory to God by faith in front of the angels, not to mention people that are watching. And one day in heaven, we believers will see clearly, as the Bible states, totally clearly, and we'll totally agree with God. We'll be like, I understand why you allowed that now. Like, and that's an understatement there. So let's just keep on reading. Go back to Romans 11.32. Romans 11.32. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Now, if this doesn't make sense to you, maybe, just maybe, that's a good thing. Maybe that's what God wants you right now so that you have faith and stop trying to pin him down for all the answers. As Pastor shared with us on Sunday, a very valuable perspective, and I put it on the board for you tonight. Let's just call it godly perspective. We don't read the Bible to try to find out how God fits into our preconceptions of him. We read it to see how he fits into his own perception of himself. The Bible is God revealing himself to us. It's not him trying to make sure that we're okay with everything. You know, It's not him trying to ease our questions, per se, although he is compassionate. He's revealing himself, like without apology, because he <laughs> has nothing to apologize for. He was gracious to the guilty by his own sovereign choice. So it's about him and not about us. And any parts about us are by grace. So here again is a verse that you might want to memorize on the board. Romans 9, 15 through 16. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So what can we conclude? What should we conclude as members of the human race that he gave life to in the first place? How about Paul's awesome spirit-filled conclusion at the end of Romans 11. You're still in Romans 11, right? Look at the next verse, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. He is so far beyond us. 
Oh. Like if we knew, <laughs> if we knew how much, how far beyond us he is right now, we would repent in dust and ashes like Job for even having a doubtful thought. If we could get a glimpse of heaven right now and his perfection and his holiness, we would never, ever question God, even once. We'd be too much in awe of not only his greatness, but his glory and his grace. So maybe, just maybe, by faith we should picture that reality to be true, that reality that the Bible tells us is reality. So that was all a summary on Sunday from the two blogs, the last two blogs we've had, really. Um, one other point I wanted to share from Sunday that really hit me was regarding discipline. And that, that discipline is to get us disciplined. You know, it's a good way to think about it. Just as a, a well-meaning parent wants to discipline the kids for a certain purpose. So the kids grow up and see, you know, the truth in life and, and you know, how to properly act or behave, etc. Discipline is to get you to be disciplined. And if you, we're not going to be disciplined on our own, God's going to discipline us to get us there, to bring us there. Out of love, as Hebrews also talks about. And sometimes things that happen in our lives are not directly related to an action or even a mistake that we've made. And that's a good one to think about because that's our natural tendency, right? We want a one-to-one -one correlation. Something bad happened. I must have did something wrong. If I do something wrong, something bad's going to happen. It's not always the way it is. It's not the way God always works. He can do what he wants. He has all wisdom. He might try a different avenue because you're so stubborn. He might let you suffer in a situation where you're serving. And you're actually serving, legitimately serving. But he says, I'm going to cause you or allow you to suffer in that situation. It might be unpleasantness. It might be ridicule. Or who the heck knows? But you could be serving God and suffering in that situation. God allowed it, apparently. Why? He is trying to refine us. And he knows exactly how to reach us, how to get to us, to grow us up. To make us more like Christ, right? We're called to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what he's doing until we meet him face to face. And that is all motivated by the love of God. Even the things he allows that might be horrible. The things that he allows that he doesn't interrupt. God has a master plan. I mean, have you ever heard somebody say maybe they were abused as a child? And now they're a believer in Christ and they say, you know what? As bad as that was, I wouldn't change a thing because I'm with Christ right now. I, know, I, know, I don't think I'd know Christ if I didn't go through that type of thing. You know, my friend Mark, I've told you about, who's paraplegic now, he said the exact same thing. I thank God because I was on my way to hell, is what he said. So is it worth it? Be a paraplegic and go to heaven forever? Or be healthy and go to hell forever? God knows what he's doing. Go figure. So it comes back to faith. And in the end, we're actually going to see totally clearly. So let's get back to our primary study on Hebrews. On the board, we have our main slide as of late. The purpose, plan, and genre of Hebrews. The overarching theme of the book of Hebrews is paranetic or persuasive. Biblical and theological exposition was subordinate to the writer's paranetical word of exhortation, which was meant to induce an emotional response. It is a homily or sermon laced with rhetorical language from a shepherd to a group of well-known sheep for the sake of encouragement. So we've been through this now. We've been through most of these verses. Uh, so to support this point, we have the outline on the board that we've been going through. On the board, the rhetoric in Hebrews, the prologue, the
the thematic statement we've been through. We're on the statement of plausibility now in chapter five and six. We're gonna get to the demonstration of proof and also closing inspiration. So again, right now we're on the statement of plausibility, which basically means credibility. Why is the writer composing this persuasive letter to this particular group of people? He wasn't writing them out of the blue, like you or I might later write a letter to someone and say, you know, I haven't talked to so-and-so in a while. I'm gonna write them an encouraging letter. That's totally different than if you hear through the grapevine that they are going through some really bad times and then you're motivated to write a persuasive, compassionate letter. So again, he's not writing to them just out of the blue. He has a very good reason knowing that they're in trouble of some kind. And that's what we basically see in uh, chapters five and six in more detail. Again, the context is that the writer fears apostasy in the church, which is falling away from the faith. We've learned this. It's a reality in the churches. You know, we see it throughout the Bible. It's sprinkled throughout the Bible regularly, which we're going to see an example of that coming up. But the writer speaks corporately to his audience because he also knows, as we talked about on Sunday, a saved person can never lose their salvation. So when he says these things, he's speaking to the church as a whole because he knows the church as a whole is drifting and they're in trouble, so to speak. So he doesn't know who's saved and who's not saved. So whenever we hear a pastor talking about apostasy, we have to remember that too. True believers are saved forever. There's no losing your salvation. It's not biblical. There were very possibly some people in this church on the way to conversion, as might be the case here in our own church. And the writer of Hebrews doesn't want them to leave. He's saying, don't leave. Some have left already. Don't follow them. Remember Christ. Whatever you do, don't leave. And I have that same message for anybody who is struggling right now, who might be listening right now, either here or online. If you're struggling and certain things just don't make sense or you're lacking faith right now, just don't quit. Don't leave. Where else are you going to go, as Peter would say? Eventually, God will open your eyes, if he hasn't already, by his sovereign grace. Just don't leave. So we were asked to remember that whenever the writer reveals a real fear of apostasy, he's speaking as a whole to the church, because the church as a whole was drifting backwards. So he doesn't know who he's talking to necessarily, but he's definitely warning people about apostasy. So on that note, turn to Hebrews 5.11. Let's see a few passages in these two chapters about the statement of plausibility or credibility. Why this letter? Hebrews 5.11. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Why is it hard to explain? Because they've become dull of hearing. <laughs> you ever try to explain something to someone that you know isn't listening? About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. This is a very serious, you know, claim, I guess he's making conclusion he's coming to. It's a sign of a church that's drifting away from the truth. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have, have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. In other words, that's where they should be, but they're not there. So he's concerned about the people becoming dull of hearing, which indicates a dangerous thing called indifference. Indifference. It's a very bad sign of what's going on in people's souls. That's why 
we've talked about over the last few years, never taking for granted that someone is saved just because they might use the name of Jesus occasionally. If they're indifferent towards him, if their life is totally about themselves, you might not want to assume they're saved. You might want to have a chat about the gospel, about what it means to surrender, about, about the fact that salvation is from the heart, not from the lips. Indifference is a very bad sign. So here again are God's thoughts on a church that is indifferent about him on the board. Revelation 3, 15 through 16. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Can you imagine? That's Jesus speaking. Then we saw where the writer characterizes this idea of apostasy. So turn to Hebrews 6, 4. Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. That does not sound good. That's beyond indifference, right? This is someone, he's saying it's impossible to renew them to repentance because they've turned away and they, they're even speaking uh, badly about God. So this is a picture of an apostate who maybe once was in the church, whose end condition is just horrible. They might, we might say, have a hard heart at this point that attacks God and won't turn back. And that's why the writer is so passionate, writing to them about apostasy. That's why it's so dangerous to leave the church. If you're confused and you're struggling, just don't quit. Stay. God will clear it up in, in the right timing for you. But don't leave and be left to yourself and your own devices and Satan's influence. This is one of the most challenging passages in the whole Bible even to interpret. And Pastor promised we will get into this in, two, in due time here in Hebrews 6. So now we have a litmus, litmus test excuse me, of saving faith as opposed to spurious faith. Go to Hebrews 6.11. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Again, what is he saying? Just don't leave. Don't leave. Hang in there. Stick together. Keep listening. Don't leave. The full assurance of hope till the end. Imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Some people call this the perseverance of the saints. But the point is that since the writer couldn't tell exactly who was saved, he was just hoping they would all stick it out to the end, proving their salvation through perseverance. Because perseverance is a sign of a truly saved person. So he's saying, just stay. You can just imagine. I mean, you can look at how passionate our pastor gets sometimes about these things because eternal life is on the line. And maybe not everybody in the church is saved yet, but just stick it out. The Apostle Paul stated this so well through the Holy Spirit, of course. Uh, hold your place in Hebrews and go to 1 Corinthians 15.1. 1 Corinthians 15.1. I was reading this the other day, and I was like, wow, that is so well said. 
it, it, and it's so clear. It's not confusing. It doesn't say, it doesn't seem to say, oh, a saved person can lose their salvation. No, it doesn't say that. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Notice the problem is with the faith. We don't earn our salvation. The problem is with the faith to begin with. It's not about a believer losing their salvation. It's about the possibility of believing in vain in the first place. So just think about that. That is clear biblical doctrine. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is getting at with them too. So finally, regarding the statement of plausibility, uh, look at Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever according or after the order of Melchizedek. So the writer reminds them of the great hope they have in Jesus Christ, the same Christ introduced in the prologue. The first four verses. Hope in Christ allows them to transcend their sufferings and their circumstances, as it does us. He's encouraging them. Hang on. Keep the faith. Stand firm because of Christ and for Christ. So may all of us step back every single day of our lives and see the big picture. And that is that Christ came for us. He went to the horrible cross to save us. And that's really all we have to know to be able to rise above it all in this life and not let anything steer us away from this amazing God-man. Amen? Let's bow. Father God, we thank you so much for your word and your clarity and your spirit making these things understandable to us. And also we thank you how your word agrees throughout. How it's the same simple message really. And we ask that you help us see more and more clarity in your word and give us more and more faith to rise above the circumstances in life that we don't understand. We give you all the praise and glory for your sovereign grace acting on our behalf. We ask that you bless us as we go, and it's in Christ's precious name we pray.